Before we get started, Bob, Mac, and I would particularly like to thank, there's a lot of people that make this happen that you don't see, but they're working real hard. We'd like to thank uh, Desiree Pettit and Jessica McKibben in graphics. We'd like to thank John Gallagher and Sam Hanna for their technical help. We'd like to thank Jeff Schrin for filming, and we would like to thank Robin Cutter and Brian Tofey over at Park County Archives for their help. And with that, I give you Bob Richard. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your support. Thank you for supporting the museum. We started this out a couple of years ago to try and get people back to the museum after COVID. I think we've done a really great job. Thank you. This probably is my most challenging talk. Uh, I grew up on Rattlesnake Creek. My mother's sister was married to one of the people there. And uh, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my growing up there and some of the other people that lived on Rattlesnake. And today I'm privileged to have uh, Bob Modell and his family here uh, to be a part of it. And hopefully he'll correct me if I say anything wrong. But anyway, uh, this is one of my best memories of being up on the ranch. And this was visiting uh, Bob Modell's uh, lodge that he built up there. And uh, I had taken Jody Rhodes Anderson, Willard and Elaine's daughter, and her husband, and gave them the tour of Rattlesnake Creek, and then we stopped at the Mooncrest Ranch and, and visited with Bob for a little bit before we went back to town. Next, this is an aerial of, that was taken uh, with, I was flying, my dad was taking photographs, and this is the old highway before they raised the lake, and then the road went around like this, and it used to be the Half Moon Bar, and they served underage people like myself. <laughs> uh, then Bob Dosey bought it, and it became the uh, uh, Eagle Valley. They had chariot races, and I came back and was partners with Willard for about three years and we built a house on the original homestead of Dock Roads right there. The main Rhodes Ranch is in here. This is where we camped. All these were hay fields. And then going up the creek all the way up to Mooncrest, this is Logan Mountain. And this is called Long Ridge. This is Trout Peak and Robber's Roost, Fly Head, Sheep Head Creek, uh, and one other creek all flowed into Robber's Roost. And we rotated our cows from calving here at the ranch out on the uh, slope here to the uh, east of the ranch. And then as the grass grew, we put them up on Logan Mountain. And we had, when I first started at about 12 years old, driving a wagon with a team of horses, going up and delivering fencing material that we got from the Forest Service. And it took us three years to build cross fences so that we rested each pasture every other year. Then after the uh, end of July, then we moved the cattle up into the robber's roost area and what we call the breaks. And we shared that with George Kless that had a ranch halfway up and he put 60 head of cows with our 300 head up there. And then when we bought him out, 
then we increased our herd size. And at one time, we owned the whole valley. But my Uncle Willard was very concerned a $20,000 debt that he was having to pay off in those days. And after six years, he sold it. And uh, so it changed hands. There were 13 homesteads in this valley that the government issued uh, the land grants to. And I have all the names and I have all the people that bought and sold in between. But it doesn't fit on today's show. But if you have questions, I do have it all written down here. So the other thing that I learned as a young man on the ranch was ranching has basically four seasons, winter, spring, summer, and fall. And as a small family, we had one hired man and his wife and all of us had to work. And my mother's sister, Elaine Rhodes, uh, and I'll go through this with you. She worked with us during the day and as 10 year olds, we were expected to ride, know what we were doing. Uh, and it comes to my mind at the age of, I think I was 12 or 13, we went over to the dry head to Carolyn Lockhart's ranch and we bought five three-year-old colts. Never been touched. Took us three days to round them up, get them loaded in the truck, and got home. And I spent the next winter and summer breaking them. And three we kept and two we sold. But I'll show you some of that. And we'll try to talk about what we did in the winter uh, the spring, the summer, but the person that carried the biggest load was Elaine. She worked all day with us, and then she had a garden, she canned, she took care of the chickens, she milked the cows. Uh, women in those days, whether it was Elaine or Anna Moon Hall or whoever, they worked harder than anybody I know. And I look back now and really recognize what the women did to make that ranch work. Bob, uh, I, I want to make a, a, a quick correction here. There are actually five seasons in Cody, Wyoming. We're in trouble now. There's winter, more winter, less <laughs> winter, July, and hunting season. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. You can tell he's related. <laughs> Let's go on to the next one. But well, Mac, you've got to do better than that. I know. Let's see here. I know I clicked the red button. There it is. Sure. This is a Jagger photograph taken in 1893 when he was surveying this country. That's taken looking up the valley, uh, and we're probably located what later became the George Class Ranch. And not a lot of trees, but uh, I thought you'd like to see some of these older photographs taken. Now that's Canyon Creek. That was on George Class's property, and that's where there are some calcite crystal wheels uh, up in the canyon. That's also where I was told as a young man that the Nez Perce, a group of them, went uh, up that canyon and backfired the canyon so that the 5th Cavalry could not chase them up the canyon as they escaped into Montana. Not all the Nez Perce, but a group of them. The Nez Perce spread out all over Yellowstone. And one group came down the North Fork, part of them went up Sweetwater and over the top, and another part came to Rattlesnake and up Canyon Creek. Next. Uh, this is looking out uh, to the east, and uh, this is the Hunter's Ranch, and 
And this was a big cattleman that had cattle on Rattlesnake, cattle on Trail Creek, and all the way over on the dry head, and had over 11,000 head of cattle, but his headquarters was on the head of Rattlesnake. Now think about, that's pretty good photography back in those days, but it gives you an idea of uh, the cliffs and, and the upper end of Rattlesnake. Next. Okay, this is looking again at the Hunter Ranch when uh, this was their headquarters. And when they gathered a herd of cattle to take to market, they started here and took 5,000 head of cattle into Montana. Uh, and that was a lot of cows back in the 1890s. Next. Uh, we're looking at uh, Mr. Newton. And he actually bought the ranch, partnered with Hunter. And uh, they were one of the first homesteaders on the ranch in the upper part of the valley. Next. This was his cabin. And we all had big piles of antlers. And today you can only find one pile of antlers, and that's up in the Wapita Valley. And Charles, uh, where are you? Uh, right back here. He has the best pile of antlers of anybody in the country, and I always photograph it. And Charles, thank you for being here today. Next. This is a pack outfit going out to hunt. And the interesting thing to me is they have a shovel in that center saddle. That's to dig through snow drifts. But Frost and Richard came up and hunted a lot in Trout Creek Basin. And uh, these photographs all date in the early 1900s. Next. This is looking down, and you can see the cabins and how uh, Newtons were trying to do uh, dude ranching, and then Anna Moon Hall, well, actually a man by the name of Dickey from over on Gooseberry came over. He sold it and then got it back, and he gave it to his daughter, Anna Moon Hall. And we'll talk more about her as we go along. Next. Rattlesnake Creek Ranch is again part of the Newtons, and they also called it the Springdale Ranch. He's up at the head of the creek where Bob has his home today, are all these springs, and so they named it the Springdale Ranch. Next. This is up at the lake at the head of Rattlesnake, and uh, lots of hunting there and uh, people would ride up to the lake. I haven't been there in years, but it's part of uh, the upper ranch. Next. This I put in, this is a cabin on Dead Indian Meadows. This is a ranger's cabin that was built and the man standing in front of his sparrow hawk, he was a ranger, and then we had the Forest Service come in in the probably late 60s, early 70s, and they said, these cabins are a hazard, they shouldn't be there, and they went through the forest, not only here, but all over the country, and burned all these backcountry cabins. Very wrong, because it was a safety place for people to stay in a blizzard or when they were in trouble. But this is one of my dad's photographs, and uh, a beautiful uh, meadow there, and it's just over the hill from Rattlesnake. Our cows would drift over the hill into this area. Next. I'm gonna talk about the DND Ranch, and Doc Rhodes came out here from Kansas City in about 1912, and I got together with another man and had him start the homestead and building. And next, this is Doc Rhodes with two buffalo, and he's on the left. And Bert Spencer, who
who we, I knew later on in years was a taxidermist. And uh, uh, he was a dentist here in town, had a practice. He also sold his practice in 32 to uh, Dr. Howe. Uh, who was here for a lot of years, and then Willard Rhodes' son, Howard, bought the dental practice from Dr. Howe. So there was a continuation. And Dr. Rhodes, in 1922, became the Yellowstone National Park dentist in Yellowstone, in addition to serving Cody. Next. This is the Rhodes family, and they were having a pretty tough time in the early 20s. And uh, this is the old cabin that was there, and Doc Rhodes brought all his relatives, and they all homesteaded up and down the creek. At the same time, he entered his son Willard and his daughter Helen into a school that's right behind here, a cabin in the right-hand corner, which we later donated to Bob Edgar at Old Trail Town. I helped take it down and haul it to town with Bobby Edgar. But anyway, Virginia St. Clair was a school teacher there and taught these children, and she met George Kless and they homesteaded up in the middle part of the valley. And uh, uh, very hard to find good photographs of George or Virginia. But uh, they lived there until Willard bought them out in the uh, 60s. And that increased his uh, size of herds that he could run on the government land. And so they went from running 300 cows to 500 cows. And uh, at that time, Willard also owned uh, part of Mooncrest or most of it. Next. This is a photograph taken in 1928. And the house on the left was torn down in 1940, and a new house was built that's still there. The schoolhouse is the next one, uh, if I can get this thing to work. This is the schoolhouse here. This was a hired hands house. It's now the office for Mooncrest. This was our saddle shop. And then we had barns, we had gardens, and that all was changed. Next. This is Willard when he married Elaine in 1935, his brother Howard on the right, and my mother, Rhea, on the left. Next. Damn it. <laughs> I just Back read. fingers. <laughs> Wait till you get to be my age. This is a project that Willard and I worked on. Uh, we always worked to get every bit of water out of the creek. And when his father homesteaded, they did not have running water. They had to haul it. Uh, when I was on the ranch growing up, we put a pipeline two miles from the spring up on the side of Rattlesnake, and the engineer says, the water will never get down to your sister. And Willard says, if you put water in one end of a pipe and put it all together, it's gonna come out the other end. <laughs> and I said, I agree with you, Uncle. Of course, I always agree with him. But anyway, we hooked it up, and we had a sister up on the hill that was, I think, 1,000, 1,500 gallons. And we filled that, and then we had a pipeline down to the house. Had another sister as a backup there that I got to clean every year. But uh, anyway, that was our first water system. And then in the 60s, we went up to Uncle Al's spring, which filled a probably a six-inch pipe with fresh water coming out of the ground. And we built a pipeline down to the house for our 
domestic water, livestock water, and we used it in sprinkling uh, our fields around the buildings, the house, and into our hay fields. But right here in front of you, we spent a summer building these rock baskets and building a diversion dam so we could cut the water out into our fields and flood irrigate on both sides. I haven't been down to see if it's still there, but I'll bet you it's still there. I don't know if they use it today or not, but uh, we thought that was quite an accomplishment. And there's water flowing over before we got it going out onto the fields. And you don't see a lot of that water ever getting past this diversion dam. Next. In addition to cattle, my mother's sister went down to her father's ranch in Byron, and she got 150 bum lambs and brought them up. And I don't think Willard was very pleased. But uh, she, in addition to the cattle, they raised these bum lambs and shared them and kept sheep around in the 30s. That was before Jody's in my time, or mostly. Next. This was putting up hay, and I'll show you some other photographs when all we had were horses, overshot stackers, and uh, Elaine is sitting on the mowing machine, and it has a sickle bar between the horses and her, but it was up, and she was tied on to the stacker and a big uh, cable, and that would pull the overshot stacker up and dump the hay, and the hired man was Hank Halavichek, and he would move the hay around and we'd stack the hay. This was before we got electricity, before we got uh, tractors. It was all by horse. Next. This is Elaine and Willard. She had just been selected as the ranching woman of the year in the state of Wyoming. And Willard was a bookkeeper, and Elaine taught him how to really ride horses and work cows, but he'd rather sit in the office. And, uh, but he got out with us, and us kids, when we were 10 years old, he would tell us to go check the grass on the Sambaugh homestead or the Jensen homestead or some other place, but he didn't tell us how to check the grass. And then we'd come home and he'd say, well, how much grass is there? How long can we keep cows on there? Well, we gave him an answer. I never was sure whether he accepted it or not, but we told him and we learned. But he never told us how to do it. It was, go do it. And that was growing up on a ranch. And uh, I can remember Elaine getting 100 chickens every spring raising them, and then we had the day that we had to kill, not a hundred, we killed all but 20. She kept 20 fresh layers, and the rest we had to butcher, we had to kill, singe, all that stuff, and then we didn't have electricity, so she canned them. And that night, what do you think we had for dinner? I hate chicken, I still hate chicken. And of course, we didn't eat our own beef or anyone else's. We ate deer, elk, and antelope. And uh, when the meat started to go bad and we had a cooler, then we'd feed it to the chickens. And we were very pleased when we did get electricity and we got in a cooler that kept cool, freezers, and she didn't do as much canning. But it was all part of the ranch life, and uh, all the extra eggs that she didn't sell in town, or the cream or the butter, but the eggs she would put in a big crock and put something in it, a milk bath or something, and then she said the eggs kept for a long time. I didn't need them, I'll tell you. Still don't. All right, next. This is Elaine, my mother's sister, Jody's mother. And the DND, I always thought it was after 
my grandfather, Dan Neville's daughter. But it wasn't. Uh, Dr. Rhodes bought the brand when he bought some cows, and it had the DMD brand on it. But in later years, we always laughed and said, yeah, that brand's Dan Neville's daughter. And my aunt accepted it. But you can see the pin around her neck. Beautiful. Next. This is Willard Rhodes. When I came back and went partners with him, he said, I'm glad you're here. And he picked Elaine up and they went to the state legislature for two months. And then they went on vacation and didn't come back until June. And the next year was that way. The only problem was is he had written the agreement for our partnership half now and half when they died and the kids supported it. The only problem was I took it down to Al Simpson and I says, Al, is this legal? And he went through it and he made some changes. He says, take this back and tell Willard he doesn't know how to write a, a uh, agreement. And he said, this won't stand up in court. So I took it back, gave it to Willard. And he looked at it and says, what, you don't trust me? I said, well, <laughs> not on this document. It's going to be rewritten by Al or we're not going to deal with it. And he got mad. He says, well, I've got to go back to the legislature next year, so you hang around. And I said, fine. And at the end of that time, I said, I'm out of here. I said, if we can't work it out and it's legal, I'm gone. And to me, it wasn't worth a fight with a relative. And I look back now, and I'm glad I'm not out there taking care of calves that are being born in the middle of the night. But uh, anyway, I learned a lot from this man. He taught me right from wrong. He taught me to go do things and think for yourself. And next, on the end of the ranch, up next to uh, Rattlesnake Mountain, he has a brass plaque talking about the Rhodes Ranch and his family members and when they were born and when they died. It's right next to the road at the end of the property, on the furthest end of the property. And uh, I am waiting for somebody in the family. Jody passed away two years ago. And we were more brother and sister than we were uh, cousins. But, uh, and Doc Rhodes is practicing down in New Mexico. And we called him Howdy. He was the dentist here for a few years, but he didn't like being called Willard Rhodes' son. So he sold and moved. Next. This is Jody and Howard, and you'll notice the Molesworth chairs, the dining room chairs. And Howdy was born in 47. He was 10 years younger than us. Hated the ranch, hated anything to do with it. And I'm sorry, but he went on to be a dentist, and I think he was a lot happier because of it. Next. That's me, and I grew up with an old pusser cat. And that cat lived all the way through high school. She was out in the hay field and lost a foot when I was mowing hay and disappeared for a while and came back limping. And I always felt bad, but she was the best cat and my one of my best friends. Next. Jody and I fishing on Robber's Roost. Uh, great trout fishing up there. We had good trout fishing on Rattlesnake where we had beaver ponds and we would catch two and a half, three pound trout when we were haying up at the upper place. But we, if we got our work done, we always found the time to go catch fish next. This is camping out up by Robber's Roost. Next. This is my wife and I in the schoolhouse behind that uh, Virginia taught. And uh, we had two sons that were born in this area. And uh, then I went off to the Marine Corps and ceased to be a park ranger in Yellowstone. But I learned to ride on this ranch. And I learned what horses were all about. Next. This is when I came back from the Marine Corps and actually ran the ranch for almost three years. Uh, loved it. My wife was a RN, a nurse, ran the emergency room. She did not want to leave the ranch 
position. I said, if we don't have an agreement, we're not staying. And she was the best calf nurse. I mean, I'd bring them in and put them by the cold stove, and she'd put electric blankets around them, get them all warmed up and thawed out. I mean, everybody worked to make it happen. But uh, I miss the memories. I enjoy going up the creek next. Uh, this is my mother on the left, myself, Jody, Willard, Elaine, and Howard. Next. These are two of my sons. The little one standing is Scott. He has Shoshone River Farms out here east of town, has more degrees than he knows what to do with, but he likes to work with his hands. And, uh, and yeah, that too. And then Jeff is on the horse, and uh, he had some Shetland in him. And when he wanted to, he dumped all three of those kids. Uh, and I made him learn to ride bareback. And uh, then we had good uh, cattle horses that knew how to work livestock, and I'd put these youngsters on them. And I said, the horses will do the work. Just leave them with a loose rein. And I saw a picture yesterday, one of them, we called him Crappie, his ears had been frozen, and they were half the size. And Jeff would sit on that horse and hang on to the saddle with both hands, and he said, does this horse really know what he's doing? I said, just hang on, you're doing a good job. <laughs> Next. And this is my son, Scott. I showed this to him last night, he says, take that out, Dad. I says, Tell me about it. He says, you're, or my, he says, my grandmother washed my feet and Anna Lane washed my feet and scrubbed my feet before we mashed the choke cherries because we were making choke cherry wine. And he says, they scrubbed them and scrubbed them and scrubbed them. And uh, you don't want to break the berries. And we had two of those big crocs full of choke cherries, and we put water in it and sugar and some yeast. And somebody sitting next to me says, oh no, it was just the foot yeast that got uh, the wine working. Uh, but anyway, uh, I kept it in after he went to bed last night. Next. This is one of a couple of photographs I have of George Kless. At the office today, there's two photographs of George sitting on a horse, and I hope I can get by and get a copy of those pictures. It's just, I, it used to be inside the door on the left side, but I'd like to do that. But George was at a place in Powell, but he did, it. he was quite a carpenter and built five cabins. While, while he lived on his ranch, and his wife, Virginia, became an invalid, was in a wheelchair. And I'll take the time to share with you. Willard and I, and I was 10 years old, drove up because we didn't have any water in the creek. We had the first water rice. We got up, George had it all cut out on his field. So Willard went over and pulled a head gate. George came over and says, what would you do that for? And Willard says, we have first water right. We will take the water. When we're done, then you can use it. You have the second water right. And George took his shovel and swung at Willard, hit him across the forehead, out cold. And here's my uncle laying there kind of shivering. George says, well, I guess that settled that argument. And then he says, here, and he pulled off his t-shirt and we wrapped it around Willard's head and I helped him pull my uncle over and into the rider side of the pickup and George says, are you sure you can drive him down to the ranch? I says, yes sir, I can. Well, I got to the ranch, nobody was there, so I drove down the damn hill to the hospital at the age of 10 and Willard woke up as I pulled into the emergency room. I'm gonna go up and kill that, you know what? And I said, no you're not, you're going in here. Well, he got 18 stitches. 
my aunt and my mother showed up and they had to help hold him down while he was getting stitched. Willard never spoke another word to George for 20 years. He spoke through me or through Jody or through Elaine. I mean, don't ever mess with a man's water. And Willard, it was a lot bigger than George, but George got him good. Uh, and today I watch people move in here and they have no clue about water or water rights. Next. And as you were saying there about, uh, there's the old adage here in the West that whiskey's for drinking, water's for fighting. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, this is my favorite cabin that George built. And uh, it still sits there. Some of the other cabins have been moved. But it, uh, George was a small man and the doors were low. But a beautiful cabin. Uh, they had guests stay in it. But uh, they lived in a little bitty shack uh, back behind here. But he had five different cabins there at the property. Next. This is his barn. He had a flume, he had a water wheel, and then Willard found out that he didn't have a cesspool. He just dumped his affluent into the creek. That was another little argument. Um, but that's ranching. But I learned you need to get along with your neighbor. You don't fight with them. You try to work it out one way or another. Next. This is the Flying Y brand that George had, a very early brand, quarter circle, wide quarter circle on the shoulder. This was a young stud horse that I was breaking to ride. And when George sold out to us, I got the brand and I still keep it registered. And I call it the Flying Ray, uh, Flying Y, as George does. Next. Now we're moving up to the Mooncrest Ranch, and this is one of the buildings that I think Anna Moon Hall, and while she had a husband, worked on, but it was never finished, and they had never chinked it. And uh, I think Bob has been working on this and making it a home for their daughter, Faith. Am I right? Yes. Okay. But uh, it's one of the older cabins, but a neat one, and I think you made a lot of changes, but uh, anyway, next. This is looking back. This was taken in the 50s. This is looking up towards the head of the creek and taken from about where I think your house is today. Next. Now, this is the old barnyard. And look over to the right. And you see that little chicken coop? That's where Anna Moon and Chaska lived in the winter when they were snowed in. They had a wood stove, two beds, a table, and two chairs. And they wintered there. They had their livestock. They had to break the ice every day so the cattle could get to it or they had to get to an open spring. But they lived in that tiny little building for at least five winters that I can remember are going up there to check on them and make sure they were alive and okay. Next. This is a photograph that we found from the archives and Park County Archives has been so helpful uh, supplying photographs for this stock and supplying me with pictures that I didn't have and I learned more from the help of both uh, Brian and Robin, and thank you for both being here today. Uh, next. This is a photograph taken by Jim Bama, and then he did a painting, and I think the painting is up at the Mooncrest Ranch. But uh, this is the photograph, and I was young and bold a few years ago and went up and saw Jim, and I said, Jim, you're a great photographer. I'd like to take your pictures of dad's and put it into a book. He says, no, I'm a painter. And I didn't go any further than that. Next. Getting into the winter, we
we were feeding cows loose hay. This is before electricity. We didn't have a tractor, but we got a Jeep in 1946. Next. And us kids got to drive the Jeep and Willard put the hay out and then we had to go refill the hay wagon. And we did that till we got balers and, and tractors and that kind of thing. And we always have to accept change. And I was quite happy to accept changing from horses to mechanic. Next. Next. This is up the creek uh, where we had cows before they came down to calf. Next. This is up on Mooncrest. We had uh, put up hay up there for five years, and this haystack is 36 bales high. You're looking at me standing on top, and we had uh, conveyor belts that helped us get the hay up, and we had balers and, and two Ford tractors, and we thought we were in heaven because we didn't have to deal with the teams of horses. Next. This is at the end of the spring season, about to put the cows out on the east bench. And while I was there, I put 550 ton of hay up on the Hollister place. And uh, we would truck it down, stack it here, and feed the cows and the calves till the green grass grew. Next. This is where we calved. Uh, in the barn in the background, when a cow dropped her calf, we would take the calf and the cow next. And we did it every two hours at night. And then we would take next, put them on a wagon or some way of getting them to the barn, made sure that they had nursed. And uh, we weighed them next. We even carried them in a gunny sack to get them in, the mother would follow us in. And we had, I think, 10 pens in there. When we weighed them, we earmarked them with the same number as their mother. And then when we shipped in the fall, we weighed the calf before he went to market, and we figured the average daily gain getting the milk from the mother and the best milk producers we kept. Not how they looked, but the more milk they produced and the bigger the calf in the days that were there, that we starved them or double starved the cows and that's how we knew our best producers. And uh, we didn't look at their confirmation a bit. We looked at what they how they took care of their calves. Next, we branded all our calves. We earmarked them in the fall before we uh, would separate them. We always had some of Dvoriak's cows in with ours. We had to separate them, make sure that we got our stock next. And then they were out on the east bench getting that fresh green grass. Next, plowing. I can remember six horses pulling a double bottom plow. I mean, that's, I'm glad I didn't do that. I hated it when I had a little Ford tractor with a single bottom plow that flipped. And I, after a couple of days of that, I said, I'm never gonna be a farmer. Next. This is up on Logan Mountain, looking down on Black Mountain, and uh, looking up the North Fork. Next, this is moving our cows from the top of uh, Logan Mountain, Jim Mountain in the background, and we're going to the breaks or robber's roost. Next, this is hay, but I had to borrow these from uh, uh, the Ned Frost collection, my Uncle Ned, and this is all with horses. The overshot stacker is going up to the hay, the horses to the right are pushing uh, hay in to put on the sacker when it comes back down. 
and then a team of horses on the left is pulling the stacker up, and my grandfather, Fred Richard, is moving the hay around on the stack. Kind of a neat picture here. They're pushing the hay into the uh, stacker, and I don't know who's backing out with a team of horses, but it gives you an idea of what an overshot stacker looks like. And there's the hay being dumped on my granddad. <laughs> Next. This is coming down from the moon crest where we had built the 36 foot bale high stack. We had two tractors in those days, a side delivery rake. We had a mower on one of the tractors. We had the uh, conveyor belts on a hay rack. The Jeep was pulling it, but you can't see it. But we had a baler and uh, then the truck behind. And we were coming down to do the hay in the lower field. Next. This is Jody driving the Jeep and a side delivery rake. And you're looking up uh, from the lower field up the valley. Next. When we got the hay up, we always had a family barbecue out in the yard. And uh, it, we still had coolers at the back door that were built into the house that my grandfather, Dan Neville, gave us and Willard put into the house as part, because we didn't have ice. The only time we got ice was in the winter time. And we joined 12 other families and went out on the lake. And we cut ice in February. And we drove out with trucks, loaded them, and hauled them to the different ranches. They put them in barns or wherever, covered them with about three to four feet of sawdust. And we put some ice in the top shelves of our ice box. But the ice would keep in our storage barns or whatever into August. And that's what we had for ice. And we made our own barbecue. They didn't have these fancy things like you do today. But uh, uh, that's Willard, Elaine, my mother. I'm between Willard and my mother. But the food always tasted better outside. Next. This is up at Robert's Roost cabin. And uh, this, the boy in the center is Jeff Willis, that was my classmate. The horse on the left, Baldy, that I broke to ride. And that was my saddle till it was stolen while I was flying in the Marine Corps. And my dog, Johnny. And Jeff was kind of a city boy, but I put him on a pretty gentle horse. And he loved being up at Robber's Roost and up in Trout Creek Basin. Next. This is Shorty Kelly. He was a horse whisperer that worked for my granddad and Ned Frost. And the sign above the cabin says Robber's Roost Cabin. And when I was a youngster, I could read on all the logs the names of everybody that stayed in that cabin. Uh, very historic. Next. That's what it looks like today. Next. This is the new Robber's Roost cabin. Uh, I think there's still a name on it, but this is the old M.P. de Moriac uh, cow camp. And uh, Scott and I and a friend hiked in there and spent 10 days, and we put a new uh, roof on there for uh, uh, Mooncrest and uh, enjoyed staying there. And uh, lots of memories came back. Wild turkeys came in, and we hiked up on uh, Trout Peak and uh, a great, and we did that in 2006. And Faith and her friends hiked in and saw us in one day. Uh, very special place. Next. Didn't you have somebody uh, fly over you and drop you some ice cream? <laughs> Not me. Well, as a naval aviator, I was saying, wouldn't it be nice if somebody brought us some ice cream? 
Well, after a bottle of wild turkey, my son called uh, Mike McHugh, who ran the air service out here years ago. And he retired from the uh, uh, airlines. And he had a little plane, and we called him up. And he said, yes, I'll bring you some ice cream. And he and Bill Shepard picked up a, a container and wrapped it up in some uh, Eskimo bars and what have you. And I set out flags on Long Ridge and so they could see the wind. And I, have, I didn't get them in here. I just couldn't get them all in. In fact, I wasn't going to mention it. But anyway, they made a pass. Everything looked good. And uh, gave them a thumbs up. Came over, dropped them with flags and then landed between the two flags and we had the Eskimos right there, Eskimo bars on the spot. And then we had the ice cream down at the cabin. Uh, and that was living. I said, next time it'll be steaks, not ice cream. <laughs> next. This is one of my favorite photographs. Trout Peak with the snow. Chalk Mountain is an icon. And uh, this is where we, the cows, when they came out of the breaks, would drop over into Mooncrest and then come down the valley in uh, October, November. And we'd pick the calves up here in October and wean them. Keep the cows behind the fence here. This was the forest boundary. And take the calves down to the ranch and we'd feed them uh, our second cutting hay and harden the calves up before we sold them and chipped them. And we always had buyers that came to us and they weighed them right there on the spot, loaded them in trucks at the main house down below. And once they were gone, then we let the cows a month later drift on down towards the ranch. And we started feeding them cake and adding to their feed to get ready to calf. Next. This is looking at it and looking at uh, Canyon Creek in the background. Next. Right at the end, Willard went to uh, Angus or Crosses. Uh, we liked the Herefords, but they had a lot of problems with sunburning of their tits, and the black cows didn't have that problem. And so it took less work on our part. Next. I put that in there, and it's still there. That was my first welding job. You can see I laid the metal on pretty heavy, but it still works. But memories for me. Next. This is a hay barn that we built. We went to the Oregon Basin and bought all kinds of derrick metal and pipe and what have you. But we stored a lot of hay here, and we fed the cows as they calved here. Next. This is my favorite picture. Uh, looking up, this is by Chalk Mountain. This was our cow camp. And the cow camp was built like a sheep trailer or camp for a sheep herder. And Willard took me up there when I was 12 in about the 1st of July. And he says, well, Bobby, now you got to keep the bolts separated from the uh, bunching up and you got to get the salt out up in the brakes and he says you got your dog and your horse and food is there anything else you want and he said I'll come by once a week and he left me so my job was riding back into the brakes spreading the salt and getting them up on the high places separating the bulls and I got to talking to that horse and that dog and they were the best company I had and I never saw a soul till the end of August when I had to go back to school and somebody came and got me. They left me food, but I learned to cook. I learned to have good company with a horse and a dog. And the only problem I had, I had to walk uh, about 300 yards to a spring coming out of the ground and I'd get a bucket of water every morning. And I'd wash and clean up and what have you. And I'd leave the bucket up on a big high deal. And you know, a big milk bucket, you wouldn't think that a mouse would get up in there. 
And I came in one day and I was hot and thirsty and took my dipper and took a drink and I looked in the dipper and there's a big fat mouse. I'll tell you, I threw him out in a big hurry. And from then on, I checked the bucket before I had a drink of water. But that was the only discourse. Oh, I had pet chipmunks that bothered me a lot. But it was a great way for a 12-year-old to learn to live and deal with life. And uh, this is in my book that's upstairs for sale, Cody to Yellowstone. And great memories. Uh, Go ahead, next one. These are horses and they're an integral part of ranching. I used to go out on the flats and see people on their three wheelers or their motorcycles with spurs on and I wonder what's wrong with this picture. But I'll tell you what, there's nothing better than having a well-trained saddle horse to work cows and uh, I just looked at that old pony of buckskin. Bob would probably tell us the name of him, but uh, I had to put it in. Next. These are some of the horses trailing up the road. Next. And this is one of Bob's black Angus. Uh, and she just put her face right in the window and I took a picture. But you know, growing up, I knew almost every cow I knew which calf was with it. I learned that they're individuals. And black cows, I had a little more trouble, but I wasn't around them as much. But when you work with livestock, you become part of them and you understand them. At least I did. And uh, always a treat when I've gone up the creek and looked at the livestock and see the grass and Bob Modell bought in up there at the head of the creek in 1976 from Curly Kelly Kapushka from Sharon, bronc rider, cowboy, drank too damn much. I had to go up and take care of things when he'd be in town for a week at a time. But uh, anyway, that's when Bob and Ann got started up there. And uh, today he owns the whole valley, and we'll look at some more pictures, but the grass is better than I've ever seen it. He takes care of the land, and I am so proud that he's there taking care of what was started over 120 years ago. Next. When we shipped cattle, when we shipped our drives, we shipped our steers, for many years before they came out with trucks, we would get on the train here and go all the way to Iowa. Every day we had to stop, unload each car, water our animals, make sure they're all standing up. And after we got them loaded, and we usually had a couple of neighbors go with us, we'd get in the caboose and we played cribbage all the way there and all the way back. Uh, but it was a treat for me to miss a week of school to go with my Uncle Willard and some of the other neighbors up the river. Next. This is today's front entrance to the Mooncrest Ranch. It looks nice. It's well put together. And next. And they have a sign and name the road. It's a private road. But uh, I'm very proud to see it and have been a part of it. Next. And the moon crest. Uh, I photographed this last spring. But uh, Anna Moon Hall added that to the upper ranch. And the moon cresting. And when you see the moon crest like that, it's, it's a real treat. Now look and you'll see C-O-D-Y in the snow. You have to have a little imagination, but it's there. Do you see it? All right, next. This is an aerial that I took 15 years ago when Ray Hall and I flew over the ranch and did a circle over Yellowstone. And 
you can see the lower field, the road going up to Bob's Lodge, and on up to the upper field where his house and barns are. And um, you can see where the Iron Creek Trail is. But I cherish this because I can look at it and sit up in there. Next. Well, do you recognize that rascal? Yeah. Thanks to Faith and Ann, we got some family pictures. Next. Here's Faith and Bobby and Ginger. Next. I thought this was Faith, and Faith said, no, that's Mom. <laughs> what a nice picture. Next. And there's my favorite. But there's got to be a pot of gold right there next to Bob. Uh, I tell you, very special. Next. Faith and Bobby. Ginger. And back behind is Trout Peak, Long Ridge, and that little uh, deal across, you can see where it moves down into Robert's Roost Cabin. Uh, and that's on top of the hill on the Iron Creek Trail. Next. This is going up to the Mooncrest Lodge. Next. There it is. And that cabin off to the right is I think the one that George and Virginia lived in down at the uh, uh, Cless place and they moved it up and it made a nice extra cabin at Bob's. Next. And that I had to get off the uh, internet, but what a great picture, Bob, and, and the things that you've done, not only for our community, but uh, with the Forest Service and others. And uh, uh, very special. Next. And I always like the American flags at the end of my talk. And uh, we have hit that time. I can stay if there's some questions. Next. Uh, the Kraken Library is, I had me doing about 20 of these talks in the past three years. And I appreciate your support. And if you have suggestions, for talks for next year, I'm going to be talking to the museum about trying to do more talks. Uh, I may not be around too much longer, but Mac Frost is just a youngster, and so uh, he's going to be helping with them. And uh, if you enjoy these, let the museum know, and we'll try to keep them going. I'll take a few questions if somebody will turn on the lights. Any, and thank any you. questions at all? Yes. Were the Colts that Bob brought back from Carolyn Lockhart's wild Colts? Carolyn said they were hers. When I got there, there were no horses in her corrals. And my granddad says they were old friends and he gave her a bad time. And they did have a wrangle horse. And, uh, John Good was her boyfriend at the time. And he got me a saddle and I rode out and gathered about 40 head of horses. And there were some young ones in it. I brought them in, we sorted them, and we found five that were about three years old. Uh, I don't know, but any horse with long manes and long tails, I call them wild, especially when we had a terrible time getting them into the truck and then driving on a dirt road all the way back to Lovell before we got on the pavement. Does it, have I answered your question? I just wondered if they were part of the wild herd that they were driving them now. Uh, are, they, are they part of the wild herd that's up in the drive now? Could have been. My grandfather, Dan Neville, he raised horses for the cavalry. And after three years, he would take his stallions out and shoot the stallions in the wild herd and turn his stallions loose with the wild horses. So both herds, both in Oregon Basin, 
uh, and he lived on Whistle Creek. He improved the horse herd, but so did everyone else. Have I answered your question? Any other questions? Bob's here and Ed's here. If you have any questions, I am so glad to see him show up in case I couldn't answer them. Yes. No, no relation whatsoever. Anna Moon was of the Dickey family from Gooseberry, and they had a Dickey ranch there and went up the Wood River. And she was their daughter. Her mother taught school, and uh, she went to school. She went to college. She traveled to private schools. And then when Dickey got his homestead back on Rattlesnake, he gave it to her, and she married, and uh, she ran that husband off in two years. Uh, and that was uh, her husband that she ran off in two years was Eldon Hall, and Eldon Hall was the brother of Bud Hall. Of Bud oh, I didn't know that. So there was a relationship. Yep. Well, that's the husband, through the husband. Through the husband, so... Now I'm learning too, thank you. <laughs> I'll tell you a quick story about Anna Moon. Uh, and this was before I was born, but her haystack burned down. And one of the homesteaders was Jimmy Price, or we called him Jimmy Tough. And uh, the next night his house burned down. <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, oh, and a romance, room. and then they... I used to go see Lucille out at her house on Hard Mountain, and she did tell me about the fire, the tough, she said tough did it, but um, I think they had a little romance. <laughs> so I don't know, you can use your imagination. <laughs> Lots of stories, and it's fun. Uh, we're going to try and put together all these in a book. I don't know if we'll get it done or not, but uh, the other questions, if you have something you want to visit about or send us a uh, suggestion to the museum for next year, we'll look at them. We've got some lists started, but it's fun to have you. It's fun to see you, and... Uh, Please come again. Thank you for being here. And, and, Bob, and Bob will be upstairs outside the Points West Market to sign his books for you. We'll see you upstairs.